Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Um, welcome to the, the podcast today, actually. <laughs> this uh, program is brought to you by the Green Living Chats podcast. And today we are really excited that you could join us today. So you are welcome. And we're going to start the program in a minute. My name is David Awisi Mensa. I'm a PhD candidate. I'm reading environmental science and engineering at Hohai University in China. And uh, I welcome you all formally to the Philosophy in PhD webinar. And so um, we're gonna kick this off because we really want us to be on time and have enough time to also interact. So I'm gonna invite um, one of my colleagues to give us a brief introduction of uh, what this webinar is gonna be about. So before we get into that, we are gonna take a short pause. Uh, just let us know where you are joining us from. So um, uh, just in a minute, I'm gonna shoot out the polls and we can go. Okay. Okay, I'm having a little bit difficulty with it. So maybe probably we can join in in the second section. All right, so um, Daniel is here with us. Daniel is currently um, a, a postdoctoral fellow at the Nanjing University of Information and Science and Technology. And uh, he is focusing on remote science and numerical modeling of land services uh, processes. And uh, he has a very wide experience in this, and he's actually one of the brains behind this webinar. And I would like to welcome him to give us the reason why we are gathered here. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. Um, let me put up my PPT. And uh, all right, um, I will share my screen shortly. So I am Daniel. Um, hope you can see me. And um, we are very, very excited about uh, this program. Uh, this is something that uh, David and I have been talking about for a long time. Um, it's for me personally, this is um, something that I have been thinking about um, for a number of years. And I have always, I've been finding different ways of sharing these thoughts with others. And so today I want to engage in a conversation that um, I want us to engage in a conversation that will help us to think more deeply on this, uh, on this uh, idea. And so I want to give a, a brief introduction to why we decided that this was necessary and this was worth talking about. Um, so it begins with a very embarrassing story. <laughs> um, I, David thinks, I should share it, but I, I felt it was, it was, I shouldn't share it though. But anyway, um, in my second year of my PhD, <laughs> um, I've forgotten which circumstances led to that, but I realized that I didn't know what, <laughs> what PhD was standing for. <laughs> and, and that's why I say it's a very embarrassing story because I accepted the admission without researching into what PhD meant. And so when I saw that it was philosophy degree, the next logical question for me is, what then does it mean if I were to graduate as a philosopher? Um, it sounded a bit strange to me that I thought I was doing science or something like that. And, and now I'm being told I'm a philosopher. And so I, I decided to pursue that. I actually decided to pursue that. And um, recently one of the, uh, articles that have really gotten me to think very carefully about this is, uh, is based on uh, an article that was written by, um, that was written by a, a French supervisor, my fellows. And there is a point that he raises, which I want to use to uh, begin this introduction, uh, which is that uh, he said they went to visit uh, um, a primary school and they spoke with uh, a teacher called uh, Prudy Henge, and they asked her her core objectives for her first graders. Now, these are, this is what she said. She said, I want them to learn to communicate. 
I want them to learn to think about their own thinking. And I want them to be able to formulate a project of their own devising and courage through to completion. Um, that's very interesting because these are first graders. <laughs> and um, how could first graders be doing this level of thinking? And it seemed to me that this was how a PhD should also uh, be sort of by default be. And so while I started exploring these ideas, I came across a number of um, helpful articles, uh, one of which has been uh, a good motivation for this, uh, this podcast and for this conversation. And we're going to be talking into details about, about this. But um, other, uh, other studies into this idea of what a philosopher actually meant uh, led me to other articles. And I came to find out that it looks like a lot of people are actually thinking about this and trying to find ways of making this work. And there are just a couple of them that I want to share with you as we uh, do this, have this conversation. Um, Mills and Berks define the philosophy in a PhD as a view of the world encompassing the questions and mechanisms for finding answers that inform that view. And I think this is very, very important because a researcher's philosophy or the way they view the world will definitely influence the way in which their study proceeds. And, and I think this is true for everyone, whether you are a PhD student or a master's student, I think that this is very true for every graduate student. And so to prepare a research proposal, especially for those of you who may have already started writing proposal grants here and there, the candidates must reflect on who they are in the world and what their worldview is. And I think that this is, this is one of the things that is um, very, uh, very well captured in uh, Dr. Bosch's article in Nature Worldview. Um, and a, and a very final point that was made in Baldwin's uh, uh, article uh, is what I think will help us to start this conversation very well, is that embarking on a qualitative research can often raise more questions than answers. I think I, I, I can definitely bear witness to this because um, I, at the end of my PhD thesis, I had more questions than I had actually answered. What is my philosophy? Where did it go? How do I find it? How do I know what it looks like? And oh, what have I got myself into? I'm sure that <laughs> there are some PhD students who are probably asking themselves this last question. What have I got myself into? And so today, with this idea in mind, we want to, um, we want to get in touch with people who have been thinking about this for a while. And we have the uh, wonderful pleasure of, of having um, Dr. Gandola Bosch. Um, I'm just going to introduce her quickly. Um, Dr. Gandola Bosch is the program director and a senior scientist in the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her interests focus on the development, oversight, and evaluation of effective and engaging science and health education programs. In her capacity as director of the R3 Center for Innovation in Science Education, RISE, she leads the R3 graduate science programs that stand for the three R's of good scientific practice, rigorous research conduct, reproducibility of scientific findings, and social responsibility of scientists to the society. This program strives to bring more critical and philosophic thinking, interdisciplinary practice applications, as well as social responsibility into the way they teach students in the life and public health sciences and beyond. Dr. Bosch holds a PhD from the Technical University of Munich and Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry, as well as a master's degree in education for the health professions from the Johns Hopkins School of Education. So ladies and gentlemen, without wasting much time, I would like to introduce Dr. Gandula Bosch. Um, Dr. Bosch, are you here with us? I think I've seen her. I'm here, yeah. Hi, good morning <laughs> or good evening good for you. Good. <laughs> such, a, such a pleasure to see you all. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you so much for agreeing to um, to, to to speak with us. Um, there are a lot of people who are very interested in in the talk this uh, today, okay? and um, we want to get straight into it. Um, but uh, we just want to give you the opportunity, first of all, to uh, to say a few words about yourself. Um, uh, more specifically, uh, concerning the topic that we are discussing today, um, what what got you involved in it? And when and why did you start thinking about the need to train PhDs to be thinkers? Well, thanks so much, first, uh, Daniel and David, for this very kind introduction and for yeah, for allowing me to be here with you. This is just wonderful. And I'm just very happy to see you all. And this is just a great honor. Yeah, um, what got us into this? Um, you know, first of all, um, neither me nor uh, the person who actually uh, founded the program, which is the chair of the department, Arturo Casadeval, who you might have heard about. Uh, sometimes he's very prominent in the news. <laughs> um, none of us has actually learned this um, in school, right? So we all uh, got into this by doing actually in the same way as, as uh, Daniel and David kind of got in by thinking, well, there is something that we should think more deeply in terms of science, right? And then um, instead of just um, continuing to learn it by doing through a lot of trial and error, we thought, you know, how were actually our heroes trained, right? Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, right? All of these people, of course, 100 years ago, sure, it was a different world, but still they were uh, trained very broadly. They were broadly, uh, trained not only in terms of interdisciplinarity, but also that we're, they were more classically trained in the critical thinking skills that come through the philosophical framework uh, that underlies a PhD, right? So yeah. um, at that time, there wasn't so much of a divide yet between science and philosophy, which is actually artificial, right? So there is no divide. It's just that we in our brains kind of make it that way, right? Yes. And yes. essentially, essentially, um, the, the PH and PhD or the philosophy <clears throat> is, is a framework that underlies all critical thinking skills that we need and do in science all the time. We are just not so conscious about it anymore, right? So we constantly think about, you know, causative relationships, right? So we think about epistemology, we think about logic, right? We, th we, are, we are prone to, to logical fallacies and to biases, right? And so needs, we need to sharpen our logical understanding in order not to be so prone to bias, right? We need to yes. think about ethics, right? So obviously, right? So the pandemic couldn't have been <laughs> more clearly mm. to, to us more thinking about ethics. And you just mentioned communication, right? Communication, one of the main skills in science mm. and science practice is communication, also one of the main leadership skills. We need to think about rigorous methods. We need to think about making our methods reproducible. And of course, you know, looking into the responsibility that we all have to science and to society, right? So all of these things are necessary for us to be good scientists. And the only thing we actually did is, um, you know, these things are not new, right? So these things are being taught since like forever. Um, it's just that we kind of made it a little bit more into a package to, you know, teach us in a structured manner. What we noticed is that um, these kind of Call it values, call it skills, or a set of both, right? We're not in a we're not taught in a structured manner in science, right? So they were quite often taught by, as I said, by doing, right? So you kind of learned them along the way from a mentor, and then you were lucky when you had a good mentor, and when you didn't have such a good experience, then well, it wasn't so good, right? We thought it was also more equal, right, in the contribution to equity if we would find a, a way to teach this in a formal manner so that everybody has access to those in the same way, right? And so, yeah, so currently we are trying to find out a way to um, make this accessible to people around the globe. It works so far very nicely in our institution and in a lot of partner institutions. We have, um, since we started, you asked me when this, when this started, um, um, we started, I think, musing about it in 2015 I started full-time on it in 2016, and then we launched the first courses a year later. Uh, in the meantime, since uh, um, I think the article was written in 2018, uh, yeah, I think the, uh, the full program launch was a couple of months later, and the accreditation came last year. So basically, we, we have a couple of years <laughs> of experience, but we are still a young program. 
And um, so far it works beautifully. Um, what was especially encouraging to us is that we saw that um, the program seems to be transportable. So it's not something that is monolithic just to our institution, but luckily, and maybe this is because of the universality of science and the values underlying science, right? And the skills that are connected with the first principles of science that work with all kinds of disciplines, be it the basic or the applied science, that it doesn't matter, right? So all of these things yeah. seem to be uh, connecting to the um, basic skills that underlie good scientific practice. And so we noticed that it was beautifully uh, transportable into all kinds of different settings, institutions, and other programs. Wow, wow, that's um, that's so nice. Um, actually, I, I I want to follow up with with a couple of questions. Um, in 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 your article, there is a there is a paragraph that I loved so much, and I, I'm going to I'm going to read it out and then follow that with with some questions. In in the second paragraph of the of the article, you said. Um, the students, they need to be taught to recognize how errors can occur. Trainees should evaluate case studies derived from flawed real research or use interdisciplinary detective games to find logical fallacies in the literature. Above all, students must be shown the scientific process as it is, with its limitations and potential pitfalls, as well as its fun side such as serendipitous discoveries and hilarious blunders. Mm -hmm. I, I really, really enjoyed this part of the article um, because I think, I mean, for me, this is how education has always been in my head. Um, I, I, I have had the chance of teaching um, different levels of education from kindergarten, primary school, high school, and the university. And my key, my key point has always been what you are, um, highlighting in this uh, in this paragraph, and so um, in this R3 program that you have started at Johns Hopkins, and uh, for those of you who are not aware of it, um, this is a program that is uh, targeted at meeting this demand and making critical thinkers of of graduate students. Um, so I would just like um, Dr. Bosch to tell us a little bit about the program, um, what goes into this program, and um, uh, is is it is it how different is it from the uh, usual way a PhD program is is conducted? Yes, um, mm -hmm. I think we all want to know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Daniel, and well, congratulations, of course, for your educational efforts. I think this is wonderful, and especially since you engaged, obviously, since many years already. Um, I love it that you uh, quoted exactly that passage. I'm not too mm. astonished. I think you have um, a background in engineering, right? So that's actually yes. um, that particular um, technique about learning from the errors is something that we borrowed from engineering, right? So mm. we always we always learn a lot from other disciplines, and this is one of the first things that goes into um, how we teach R three and how our program is structured, is mm. um, that we uh, try to always learn what can other disciplines offer. You know, we should, we should, I think we, we humans need to always think about that disciplines themselves is a human construct, right? Mm -hmm. Nature does not have any disciplines, right? This is yeah. us, right? So we, we humans are not, a lot, we are not, we are not, you know, clever enough to get, to, you know, get the gra grab of the entire, of the entire universe, right? This is just yes. too big for us. And hence, we, of course, make small little pins so that we make an attempt to at least, you know, mm -hmm. get a little bit of an understanding of how nature functions, right? But yes. um, nature itself is a big something, right? So it's, it's everything together, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, we, we try to make at least a little bit of an attempt here to try and learn what can other disciplines offer. And this is a lot, right? And, you know, there's just um, many different other things, but, you know, among the ones which you quoted here is, um, you know, as I mentioned, learning from other disciplines, but both in the good and in the bad, right? So, like, mm -hmm. we need to learn, as Medwa already said, you know, the Nobel Prize yes. winner decades ago said, you yes. know, we need to learn from the science, how it's being done. And, you know, as you all know, right, science, as it is, it, uh, it's being conducted is trial and error a lot, right? So, we mm -hmm. learn from our mistakes, and that's the nature of science, right? It doesn't make any sense to just always talk about stellar science. Of course, this is always nice, right? But we also yeah. need to kind of see what can happen if we don't do science well and what can we do better, right? And things like this are very instructive. And of course, as you mentioned, 
not losing not um, losing sight of the fun side in science and learning from all the different <laughs> brilliant blunders yeah. and also on from serendipitous event which have been major sources of innovation just look at penicillin mm. penicillin and mm. all kinds of other different things right yeah um what goes into the program um in a nutshell, um, we can say that you know those three core values of science or three core principles of science, rigor, reproducibility, and responsibility, um, mm -hmm. are being taught in our program um, through a focus on, on rigor, right? So we, we focus on, on rigor and how it's being lived. So essentially mm -hmm. what we put into the program, and I mentioned this already briefly in my in my introductory remarks, um, we teach um, with a strong focus on, on integrity, right? So we have a lot of ethics in the program. We have a lot of focus on, on logic, logical errors. We have a lot of focus on causation, epistemology. We um, teach uh, experimental design with respect to, for example, how can research be redundant, right? So these kind of things, package redundancy into your research design. Um, another practical skill set that we teach, we noticed that, um, uh, a lot of us, uh, especially in the um, biomedical sciences where I come from, right, so I'm originally a biochemist, um, noticed that a lot of us are not exactly brilliant when it comes to uh, probability and statistics. <laughs> so we kind of um, <laughs> emphasize the quantitative skills a bit more. Also mm. because, um, and this is one of the main um, um, underlying motivations for the program that came earlier, I think it started in like uh, in the first half of the uh, 2010 years um, that uh, Arturo Casadeval, the chair of the department, also the founder of the program, as well as uh, some of his friends, among them uh, Dr. Farid Fang from the University of Washington. At that time, they were all editors in chief of, uh, of journals. Actually, Arturo still is. And they had a lot of access to um, data and articles, of course, right? And what they noticed together with a couple of collaborators that um, you know, several of the main issues and mistakes in science would fall into several categories, right? Where people always mm -hmm. committed the same kind of mistakes. Oh, and then okay. they found out like, you know, we have to do something about this, right? First of all, they kind of looked into, you know, what, what are the main reasons why people always make mistakes? And then they kind of find out the usual suspects, right? Some of the factual errors, some are random errors, you know, some are simply systematic errors. A lot of errors come from, as I mentioned, from problems in quantitative thinking and critical thinking. And then um, they published a paper, and Arturo always um, refers to this paper uh, regrettably as the most quoted paper is about the, where are the most errors in science, you know, where in which kind of oh, category wow. are they falling into. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, it might be it might be that this uh, paper has been overtaken by some other papers. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> what what they what they came about is that um, they uh, came together with a couple of other uh, scientists who then looked into, okay, what can we do about this, right? How can we do it better? Then there were other people like in the open science community that you're well aware of, right? They looked into how can we um, publish better procedures um, and how to do uh, best practices for science. They came up with all these open protocols and all these kind of things. And then um, the community came up with a big database uh, called Retraction Watch. Right, that looks into uh, which articles are being retracted and when for what, right, across the different mm. disciplines. All these kind of developments came in short um, sequence uh, after one another. And then uh, the community thought, well, you know, maybe we can make use of all those tools a bit more, right? And we came up with the idea of case, you know, we, we need to not only give recommendations, but we really need to package this into a formal program. Mm. And this, um, this formal program is then the R3 program after those three core values. And, you know, essentially what we do is um, we identified what is still, in our view, working very well in a PhD education. First, we focused on PhD education, but now we kind of broaden this to all graduate science education, right? Okay. So science being, um, science being uh, viewed here very broadly, right? Not only like the biomedical sciences, we view science in a very broad and inclusive manner, both you know, basic applied as well as, you know, scientific aspect of, um, of, of the humanities, for example. So everybody who does in a structured, rigorous manner, um, uh, produce new knowledge from, mm. from um, certain subjects, right? And um, so what we decided to do, at least, of course, this is something that is very US focused, right? And knowing mm. that uh, PhD and graduate science education systems differ around the world. But essentially, um, and I think this is uh, universally applicable, is um, that we wanted to create more room for critical thinking 
um, activities of all sorts, right? So okay. we wanted to move a bit away from everything that's just too much focusing on subject matter learning by heart. We of course know that uh, there is some subject matter knowledge necessary for all of us, mm. but it yeah. shouldn't be the only thing that we do, right? So um, mostly, mostly um, uh, colleagues uh, teach for fear of missing out, kind of it's a FOMO in a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, a fear of missing out uh, the necessary uh, knowledge uh, to their students. We think that um, a lot of the knowledge that's being taught can be it can be either taught by Google or whatever. It's so like everything that's <laughs> in, a, in a browser, what have you. It doesn't have to be Google. It can be all kinds of it can be all mm -hmm. kinds of web browsers, right? But um, you know what we. You know what we have essentially on our cell phone is the knowledge of the world accessible right mm. but we do not teach people to integrate this knowledge and to critically think with it right yes. and this of course is something that cannot be just switched on this is something that as you you know said daniel yourself when you started teaching um students already in kindergarten right this needs to be taught from early childhood onwards it's a habit of mm. mind right critical mm. thinking is something that we need to think and uh, adopt for us from early childhood onwards right it helps us in daily life it helps us in science right mm -hmm. think about you go shopping right and somebody else wants to sell you something and to sell you something is perhaps not what it lives up to right essentially mm -hmm. a bias or a logical fallacy right when you have this mindset of critical thinking you're being less fooled in daily life right with everything yeah. that's going on in the in the <laughs> current uh, and, uh, pa pandemic of course it, it couldn't have been more clearly that there were a lot of uh, fallacies, a lot of um, logical errors in the way how science was transported, in the way how it's perceived, in the way how many members of the public are being fooled by demagogues, by people who provide falsehoods, right? And we scientists then have to work against that again, right? Mm. So, which also, you know, speaks again for this um, absolute need to do um, science communication well, right? So, mm. all of these things we thought should be packaged into a program and taught formally. And so essentially what we did in our program, we kind of created a bit of room. So we, um, um, we are teaching still some subject matter, uh, but it just the main focus is not on subject matter. The main focus is on these skills. And then we bring in the subject matter through the vehicle of critical thinking, logical thinking, ethically thinking and acting. And so um, we, um, that's actually all. We just created a bit more room um, we um, leave room for the fun side in science, we teach from blunders, and we kind of uh, look into the core values of science. So essentially, you know, the example that you um, mentioned earlier about detective games, so that comes, for example, in a very concrete example from a course that we call the anatomy of scientific error. Right, okay. so and it's, oh. it's, as wow. the name already says, you know, it, it kind of dissects a little bit, you know, where could the errors in science come from? And what mm. we essentially do is, and you mentioned the detective games, so essentially what we do is um, we um, walk through certain categories of how errors can occur. And then we um, give our uh, learners the opportunity to look into Retraction Watch. You know, as you know, retractionwatch.com is a browser um, mm. available for everybody. Uh, it's actually, it, it says .com, but it has nothing to do with commercial, right? So that's a, that's okay. a, that's a, a nonprofit and a, um, uh, an organization by a lot of volunteers who, um, essentially um, assemble a block. They monitor all the retractions around the world in all kinds of different subjects and put them together in this blog post. So if you ever feel the need to get depressed, right, then you subscribe <laughs> to their newsletter <laughs> and you get uh, per day at least, you know, five or six retractions that come out, right, wow. per day. And this is wow. really across all disciplines, right? And so okay. essentially, um, we let, um, this is this one exercise that I want to just briefly, briefly describe. We give the students the opportunity to kind of browse this uh, database and kind of identify, mm -hmm. you know, which are the mistakes that um, fall into various categories and what happened um, in these uh, in these articles. What happened uh, when when articles were retracted because of certain mistakes, and what could have been done better in order to avoid those mistakes from the get go, right? So, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, so these are actually quite good exercises. Um, at the end of that course, uh, the students have walked through a couple of those um, uh, mistake categories and then analyze a preprint, right? A preprint, mm. of course, is something that can be stellar work, can also have yeah. some flaws in the beginning. And you provide recommendations for the authors, like, folks, could you, you know, maybe look into this a little bit more? And we think this is a kind of authentic way of teaching a scientist to do science, because, of course, 
you know, we all have Definitely. to do peer reviews, right, at some point. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's something yes. that, you know, we try to bring in exercises into our courses that are very close to reality, right? Mm -hmm. So to bring in, you know, what are the things that a scientist should do, right? So, and this is something that we think is preparing people good and well for, you know, what, what uh, mm -hmm. science in activities around the world and it, across all different disciplines and also across all different professions can, can uh, demand of us, right? So, mm -hmm. You know, we kind of are not uh, a program that only teaches science for academia. We teach them for, you know, scientific skills that can be applied in all kinds of different functions in society. Because, mm. you know, we think there can never be enough scientists in our society, right? So yes, like... <laughs> definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think um, David will be very happy to hear that because um, uh, David and I are, are sort of approaching the same idea with different objectives. Sort of David wants to see how this works out in the industry. And and I am interested in seeing how this works out in the academia. So it's uh, <laughs> we are sort of trying to balance um, this these things. And um, I I really really enjoy the part where you talk about your students criticize uh, sorry uh, looking into uh, these errors that are in publications because I personally had an experience where we went for a very big meeting with top scientists from all over the world, and and in that meeting I asked a question. Um, the question I asked was that, uh, is it possible for, for you to share some of the mistakes that you've been making <laughs> um, somehow so that we can learn from you? We, can, we, don't have to, we wouldn't have to go through all of these mistakes and, and we learn to think uh, better. And I had a very depressing answer uh, in that meeting <laughs> where one of the scientists said, well, no one gives you a grant for publishing wrong, wrong things you did. So... <laughs> Mm -hmm. So it's um, mm -hmm. so then they don't want to expose the the sort of the mistakes that they've made here and there. But I I, I personally feel that this is this was necessary because um, in my school I this is one of the things I've been doing uh, since I I started my master degree and I have been trying to share my mistakes with people, trying to uh, make sure that they don't go through the the same way and to sort of, sort of help us to think more critically about these things, but also to also criticize me in the mistakes that I, I, I made as well. And uh, I recently also came across uh, something called negative publications. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's young, but it's something that I want to encourage our listeners for today also to, to look into, uh, where I think people are encouraged to publish their mistakes. Um, and it's good that we can get to criticize uh, <laughs> what, what is happening around. And so thank you so much for what you are doing and it's it's very encouraging but um i i would think that as you have as you designed this program from the beginning based on the data that you had um while you're going through the whole program there is a point where you find that well okay we have to make changes here and there are you learning lessons to see okay where do you have to make changes what are some of these lessons that you, you, you are learning? Because at the time of the article, you mentioned that you had very little data to go by. So I'm mm -hmm. sure that now you have sufficient data. So what are some of the new lessons that you are learning? What are some of the revisions that you've had to make to the R3 program? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Um, I, let me just say that we are doing structured evaluation research on that program. Just for education, this takes years. <laughs> mm, so. Yeah. Um, I would say, um, as an educational researcher, you'd never have enough data. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, we, uh, you know, we do this in stages. <clears throat> Not all of these um, courses have been launched at the same time. Of course, we did this, you know, we kind of phased in the courses as we had them because we wanted mm -hmm. to bring this to the students as, as um, quickly as possible. Um, <clears throat> and we have, of course, some of the older courses, which are our core courses around, you know, basics uh, in the introduction of you know, philosophical and first principle underpinnings of science. This is the, this is the oldest course. Then this anatomy of scientific error is also a larger course. And then uh, some of our ethics courses are the older ones and then there's new ones coming, right? And of course the new ones tend to be a little bit less evaluated than the old ones. What okay. we learned so far um, is um, uh, that uh, first, uh, this interdisciplinary aspect is something that seems to be coming across very well and also seems to be something that our students draw the most from. So this aspect of really having a, a framework to teach principles of science 
and then letting the students apply it to their particular interests and fields and then allowing the students within a class that is a mixed class of students from many different disciplines interests and research experiences also even different levels of experience because of what i have not mentioned so far we have actually students from many different also age groups right so we have okay. students who are very young uh, graduate students and some who are um you know let's say seasoned practitioners uh, the reason for that, as so just as a side note, is because our school has um, many different degree programs, uh, okay. and we um, uh, accept students uh, like uh, right after undergraduate and right also later in life. And people want to do, uh, for example, a master in public health or something, okay. right? And these tend to be, for example, physicians who later in life want to have a degree, right? Uh, our program is uh, um, housed in a molecular microbiology department. However, we produce courses for the entire school and the entire university, and hence oh. we have such a big um, spread okay. in different disciplines. And this is actually one of the uh, enormous enrichments of our program and where we learned mm. from, because you asked me about what we learned. Mm. What we learned really is that um, bringing people together from disciplines, different divisions, and different interests, also different levels of experience, is what really made this program a great success because then also people can in bring in, in all the different uh, applications of the principles of science, but also can see how they how did they live it so far in their educational and their um, scientific practice right. Mm -hmm. And this uh, helps a lot when people then share these experiences, so we get in, mm -hmm. in terms of the um, course feedback and when we ask for evaluations. What people really um, across the board and over the years uh, told us unanimously is that they learned as much from the principles of science as well as from the applications when they see how many different colleagues students comrades whatever you know brought it together and uh, looked at um, how do we lift this in our practice how are the pitfalls that we shared so we would actually avoid the situation that you unfortunately encountered in that conference mm -hmm. that people were um, not um, how should i say courageous enough to share you know problems in science right um, that's actually, I'm not astonished that you got that reply. It's, it's sad, of course, uh, but it's, it's not astonishing. Um, scientists are not encouraged to show weaknesses, right? So that's something that is not, that is not, uh, you know, quite often, you know, well regarded. Also, you know, look at, look at how the public reacts when science, of course, live and in real time now developed vaccines, right? Mm. You know, it, it is something that we all just, you know, we have a new set of vaccines that we need to try it out, right? So we are uh, gaining new experience, the, the way how the studies progress, right? And there are things that go to and fro, right? And of course, when you, when you communicate uh, to the public that science is trial and error, right? So then there are things that we need to, we need to learn from our mistakes. It's something yeah. that a lot of people feel insecure about right so it's it's something that i'm not astonished that this particular practitioner did not want to share you know and was not perhaps not prepared to share mm -hmm. this in front of the public however um there are a lot of practitioners who who do that right so mm -hmm. so what we do and this is another thing goes to your question about what we learned is um what our students uh, asked more and more and this is what we bring in more because we tend to listen to the feedback of our students mm -hmm is that we don't only teach those principles and let our students apply, but we also bring in people for the, we call them fireside chats, right? In the summer, we call them garden okay. chats, when it's too warm for fireside, right? Um, okay. Essentially, um, we ask a couple of practitioners, um, uh, would you, um, so how do you live this type of um, uh, critical thinking education and these um, approaches to rigor, reproducibility and responsibility in your practice? And what, how does it look like if this doesn't work, right? And what did you learn from if it doesn't work, right? Mm. And this um, brings a lot of authenticity also to the program. So you have um, people who sit there and talk of, out of the top of their heads, like me now, right? So about, you know, how does this um, R3 or 3R approach look in your scientific practice? And mm. uh, when did it go wrong? And what did you do about it, right? And how did you how did you make it better, right? So where, did, mm. where were the things that you um, made changes to your scientific approach in case you noticed that things did not go the way how you wanted it, right? Yes. And uh, this is something that uh, is very instructive. As you mentioned, it's it's not very popular yet. However, mm. there are, um, you know, tendencies for people who do that. And most of us, you know, of course, 
uh, this has to do with funding, right? So like when you when you have um, journals in every discipline who um, are um, able to have a, a business model uh, that you can publish failed results and what you learn from it, sure, this is mm. probably very instructive and very good for, for the scientific community, right? Mm. Yes, yes, very true. Yeah, what else did we learn? Um, um, yeah, so I think we talked about this a little bit when we discussed uh, um, before we, we went live here last week yeah. <laughs> um, uh, about um, how to implement such a program, right? So yeah. how to bring it to life. That was probably the more the steepest learning curve, I would say, right? So, um, you know, in the beginning, when you have something new, um, there's always resistance, not so much because people want to be not nice. It's It's because people are afraid that you know, that established things should perhaps, you know, have Continue. had some validity, right? Let's call it yeah. like that, right? Okay. And then uh, people are afraid that what you bring in as innovation might be harmful, right? Yeah. And this is something that I kind of value because people, of course, you know, every educator around the globe puts their heart into education, right? So you're not in education if you don't like it, right? So those people yeah. who don't like education, they are not doing it, right? Yeah. So there's, there's mentors and there's educators and they have learned themselves in a certain way and would like to get their students the same benefits right mm. and they think of course you know the way how they have been trained is the way how it should be right and this is kind of understandable and this is yeah. and any every innovation causes fear that what you bring in is perhaps harmful and so of course in this case what we try to do is to try and win trust right mm. so it's something the same way as we scientists have to win trust with the public we tried to win trust with our colleagues. And uh, this was something that uh, was a, a long process. Um, there are some colleagues who are a little bit more into innovations and uh, came to us a little bit more earlier and some colleagues who needed a little bit more coffee. <laughs> so what we did a lot is we um, sat with individual colleagues and we gave a lot of talks like this one. We mm -hmm. um, sat with colleagues individually and told them and invited them into our educational sessions. We invited them for the fireside chats and showed them, you know, this is what we are doing. And this is what our students make out of it. <laughs> and now also, <coughs> because you mentioned what uh, what the data are, we are in the process of collecting some more long-term data, not only course outcomes, that okay. we um, started working now that we have, you know, a, um, a, a good set of students and a, a stronger cohort, that we can uh, also work with the lab practitioners and the lab supervisors. Are our students showing that they're applying those principles in their laboratory practice or mm. in their study practice when it's a social scientist, right? Mm. So in which mm. way are students um, integrating um, the principles of science into the way how they do science, essentially, right? And so of course, this can be very multifaceted. This is why I said, you know, the, the data of course are still young because you have a lot of students. We have in the meantime taught up over 2000s at our institution alone, you know, this is, wow. and this is of course, uh, just Johns Hopkins. I have to say over the years, right? Uh, the reason for that is because we have some courses that are large, right? So okay. um, we have courses that go from uh, participant numbers of five or six, when this is more seminar style, to people mm -hmm. who are in, in one course about 150 or so, right? So, and then of course, if this course, like the big ethics course is offered four times a year, of course you come to 400 students a year, right? So, yeah. so that of course it accumulates a bit more quickly. Yeah. Um, uh, but what we, what we really learned from, from, this, um, um, from this implementation is that uh, apart from the fact that students really like to be together with people from other disciplines, is mm. that uh, the students give us as feedback, and we learn this also now in, in uh, increasing uh, numbers from uh, our interviews with the, with the lab PIs, with lab mentors, or with um, people who um, we uh, talk about in their future professional practice. So when it's a master student, of course, leaves a little bit earlier than a PhD student, um, uh, that uh, uh, people feel that they can use this type of critical thinking in sort of a mindset fashion also in their professional practice later on. So okay. in terms of outcomes, we are of course on the young end here because the mm. student, uh, the, the, the program just uh, uh, started to follow students a little bit longer. <laughs> mm. So I would say the data are still um, um, in the early stages, I would say, ask me in a decade when, when you ask me for real data. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what we really learned are these things that, um, uh, that uh, it seems to be creating a mindset. Of course, um, every practitioner needs to then continue 
practicing this mindset, right? So that's something that um, is significantly more important than you know just giving a couple of courses that are short, right? This mm -hmm. is like a crash course experience, but you know we all know like writing and communication, for example, right? We need to train this forever. This is a yes. skill set that always evolves, right? And you become better and better at it. Critical thinking is like a muscle, right? So this is actually something that Arturo always says. Arturo is an MD, PhD. Of course, he always has this physician uh, notion to it. And he says, well, critical thinking is like a muscle. Right? It needs to be continuously trained, right? You, mm -hmm. you give people an idea of how it goes and then you do your exercises and you do them in applied fashion throughout your life, right? Mm -hmm. We all know that communication skills need to be trained all the time, right? Writing skills need to be trained all the time. And the same way, when you when you uh, looked at the way how you um, um, were uh, discussing in courses for ethics, for example, right? Research ethics. There's continuously more programs. There's more new situations that you need to look at, right? Mm -hmm. There's the classic problems in science ethics, and then there's new problems that come. Be as you know, you engineers, yes. I don't have to tell you this. Self-driving cars, right? So yes. um, the Internet of Things, all these kind of new technologies that come with yes. enormous possibilities and come with ethical problems. So also ethics is something that needs to be continuously trained and evolved, right? Yeah. All of these skills need to be um, continuously applied in a certain manner and allow us, yeah, enormous freedom of, of thinking, right? Which is, yes. I think, the greatest strength of this, of this approach is that, that you notice how much you, you gain from it in terms of the possibilities, right? Which are sheer endless, right? And it just... Yes. You mentioned curiosity beforehand, right? So curiosity is something that we feel is um, is not is not suffocated in this program because we are not bombarding people so much with subject matter, but it's kind of furthered because you you realize what is your potential, right? What is the pot what are the endless possibilities of looking into um, the means of science and discovering things for yourself and for for the scientific community? Hmm. Wow! Wow! Those are very 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 good lessons um there is just so much that i would like to <laughs> um to pick up on and sort of go deeper into but we want to give others the chance to also ask you questions because we know that many people are burning with questions uh, but i'll just uh i just want to ask one important question that i think might be on everyone's mind and i'm sure that you can give a very brief answer to that um, um, in in my in my endeavor to at least in my research group to teach uh, students graduate students about critical thinking, I've 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 always enjoyed sort of engaging them in in, in a thought experiment here and there and and asking them questions about what we are doing, trying to get them to react to it and to give me a feedback here and there to talk with others because really communication is key. Um, but it. I am beginning to suspect that this may not be for everyone. Um, it's, I, I, I don't know if it's my, it's, if I need to keep changing my way of doing things or that I need to sort of have, I need to sort of assume that, okay, this is not for everyone. So the question here is, is this for everyone? Is critical thinking for, for every graduate student? And, um, and, 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 if, if someone is being trained to think critically, how, how would they balance that with, say, graduation requirements? Um, I need to graduate. Mm -hmm. I need to publish my thesis. Um, I need to, yeah. So mm -hmm. how have you found that? Yeah. Good, good points. Um, there are, of course, a lot of people who have different ways to do critical thinking. I think critical mm -hmm. thinking is inherent for every human being, everyone, okay. everyone, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And you see the evidence for that is, there's countries actually who teach um, philosophical and critical thinking foundations, of course not you know, in terms of like, let's talk about science, right? Mm -hmm. But the way how critical thinking is being introduced in early childhood education in the Scandinavian countries is famous. That's actually published oh. since decades, right? So that's, that's wow. something that they have, have done since early childhood onwards. Of course, you know, they're not looking into, you know, what are the mechanisms behind X, Y, Z, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. training other things, right? As I mentioned earlier on, critical thinking helps you in daily life, right? Mm -hmm. So just, you know, think about you go to the supermarket and make a more critical assessment about what you buy, right? Um, um, they ask uh, the, the young children in, for example, Finland, I'm just picking out one now, yeah. right? So this is, there's many other yeah. examples, but I'm picking out one yeah. now. Has been done also in South America and other countries. Um, 
you know, they ask uh, the children all kinds of open-ended questions that connect to their daily lives, mm. right? And ask them to think creatively, critically, and also uh, curiously about certain things, right? You just press people not so much into a framework from early childhood onwards, right? Mm. And, you know, I think every human being is into critical thinking. The question is how you package it, right? Okay. Not everybody has the same access to it, and this is fine because our way, how we think and how we how we react, of course, is shaped through our life, our life experiences. Yes. What we what we noticed is because, and, and I, I like very much that you brought up the experience of looking into um, uh, teaching uh, learners from different age groups. Um, we are also just trying to expand into different um, learner levels, right? So, for example, also into high schools or into okay. elementary schools. And then the question is, you know, how do we do that? You know, how do we enthuse other people for this type of thinking so that it's cool? It's not something that find like, oh, I don't know what to do with it, right? Um, of course, you need to kind of make it palatable. What we noticed is that you, you mentioned communication. Communication skills are a major vehicle for transporting thinking skills. So um, what we try to do is we try to bring uh, people from various different backgrounds, interest groups, what have you, right? Subject matters into try to communicate to somebody who is not um, a peer, right? For example, mm. not a colleague, right? Try to communicate a difficult subject to something else that um, who is not um, equipped with the same background. So like, just imagine you sit in the bus, right? You sit on the bus <laughs> and the person next to you um, finds it, uh, you have a book open, whatever, what have you. You look yeah. at something on your cell phone, right? And then uh, the person just looks over your shoulder and is like, oh, this is interesting what you're doing there, right? It mentioned that I'm a biochemist, right? So like mm -hmm. I, I was trained as an X-ray crystallographer. So I saw protein structure originally, but of course it was a while ago, right? And so um, my parents, I'm a first generation, right? So I, I, my, none of my, none, nobody in my family prior to me has an, has an academic degree, right? Okay. And so, um, so, but my parents are curious, right? So like, okay, so what do I do? Like when, when, my, when my parents noticed that I was trained in, in um, protein structure, I said like, you know, what are you doing? And of course these conversations come up at the breakfast table, right? So where you don't <laughs> really have like a PowerPoint, whatever, right? <laughs> And besides, this would have been the wrong vehicle because my parents don't know what a protein is, right? And mm. don't know what protein structure is and why this is important. Mm. So yeah. learn how to explain things with simple things, right? So in this case, I explained protein structure and in how do we critically evaluate whether certain drugs fit into certain aspects of that protein structure, right? With what is on a breakfast table, right? So you have like a mug with a, you know, like I'm having a mug here, right? So like, yeah, yeah. explain that the protein is the mug and then you have a lid somewhere and you have these kind of different ways how to explain things with simple things. So start with mm. these exercises, right? Okay. Start with a way how to um, bring um, certain contexts that have to do with critical thinking and try to uh, let other people explain it in simple terms and then mm. make it gradually more, more difficult, right? Yeah. When you, when you connect it to daily life situations, you will see that a lot of people get into it, right? So they like um, explaining things with simple terms and also explaining it to others. And mm -hmm. that way, of course, you have the side effect that you're creating new teachers as well, right? So like this. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think, yeah. um, you know, it depends on the vehicle, right? And it depends on how you package it and... Um, what kind of um, relevance it has for the respective people, right? So if it's something that is abstract and nobody really connects anything with it, you know, <laughs> it, you will not reach anything. But critical thinking is, in, is everywhere. You know, mm -hmm. this is like the air we breathe, right? This is everywhere. And the more we practice, the more we kind of find it relevant to what we are doing, right? What I do often is, uh, and this is what we, um, uh, often in order to lure our students into that course is we don't teach with you know big philosophy textbooks i mean sure and there's there's <laughs> these wonderful people who are philosophers who um you know connect a lot with these textbooks it's not that i'm not quoting from those textbooks but what i teach with are newspaper mm -hmm. articles okay. right so this is you know articles from the new york times and from the from, uh, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a magazine called The New Yorker. It's very well known for its critical analysis articles. Or with YouTube, you know, you, you, you guys are on YouTube. You know, mm. there's a lot of things on YouTube. Things about um, 
uh, take a TED talk, you know, one of those, you know, they're short. <clears throat> Don't take students uh, too long for sitting like forever in lectures, just 15 mm -hmm. minutes, this short talk. And then either take the subject of that talk, or if you find um, an article that has a logical fallacy in it, right? I mean, <laughs> since the pandemic, we have gazillions of material where logical yeah. fallacies have been openly distributed, right? Yeah. So yeah. people have been showing biases, how we have been showing uh, flaws in logical thinking forever, right? So like mm. even the WHO has not really done a very good job in the beginning of the mm. pandemic, right? So mm. very easy to find examples, right? And then, you know, the only thing you have to do is in the beginning, uh, come up with a couple of um, accessibly presented um, descriptions of uh, principles in science, and then let people apply to daily life situations, right? Just look at, you know, recommendations for what is good for you in terms of food. And this is every day, right? So you, every day you find a recommendation, one time tomatoes are good for you, and the other day tomatoes <laughs> are not good for you, right? So <laughs> you find all of these things, right? So all of these things are completely full of logical fallacies, right? Or mm. biases in, in the scientific mm. practice. The, and, and, and science communication is actually, you know, one of the prime examples where mistakes are made like every day, right? Mm. So take those examples that everyone is exposed to and connects to and then train people in that way um, to, to look into how, what can critical thinking do for you in order to avoid those mistakes in order not to, not to be fooled by other people's mistakes. Wow, wow. Um, I wish we could really go on, but I, I, I want to give the chance for people's questions to be answered. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> David is going to, to, to come in and, and um, uh, extend the questions of, of, of the participants to you because I think others want to ask questions as well. So David, you want to help out in them um, uh, Getting the questions to Dr. Bosch. Are you are you ready to do that? Or should yes, I continue certainly. talking? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, David, you yeah. are. Yeah, so um it's it's been really amazing. Uh so many things packed. I think I really have to go back to this and keep reading and reading and reading again. So <laughs> but I just want to remind everyone that um we have uh we're going into the QA section. So if you have any question, um, we already have some few ones in the chat box and we also monitoring other platforms to see if we can get more. But if you have a question, just um, raise your hand and I'm gonna uh, call you and you can open your video and share your question or your thoughts or anything that you have. But um, we'll quickly take one poll uh, just to know your thoughts and where you are joining us, probably your discipline. So let's just take about 10 seconds to do this and here we go. Okay, so let's do this in a few seconds and yeah, here we go. In the meantime, I would like to remind you that this webinar is brought to you by the Green Living Chat podcast. And we use this platform to um, discuss and measure environmental issues around the world. And we also use this platform to promote environmental related projects. Um, we are also trying to bridge the gap between um, research and also the industry. So if you are interested, mm -hmm. uh, just send us an email on glcinfo at ecoamidsolutions.com or info at ecoamidsolutions.com and we'll be willing to really discuss your research results on the podcast as lots of um, industries should be interested in this. So we got the polls here and we have majority of us coming from the natural and applied sciences um, followed by social sciences and humanities and business. Thank you so much for um, participating in the poll. And so we'll take some few questions. Um, and so I have one friend here who would like to share his question. There's a very long statement. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name very well, but it says Jackson, yeah, Jackson. Um, can you um, unmute yourself and share your question, please? 
Hello, Jackson. Okay, Hello, so, good. oh, perfect. Hello, yeah. sorry, good evening. Oh, good afternoon. Okay. Yes, please, uh, Mr. Coordinator, please, could you repeat yourself? I didn't get you clearly. Yeah, I was saying that you had a question, you had some thoughts on the on the chat, and I just wanted to know if you would like to share it, read it out, and uh, also share if you have a question as well. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, and I want to thank the, the doctor for the presentation. I believe it's something that we all need to understand clearly before we proceed into selecting PhD or deciding to pursue a career in uh, academia. Well, my thought is this. I know from my understanding, I know that uh, the philosophy in PhD has to do with ethics and uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. Because if, if we look at it critically, it is true, being ethically upright and collaborating with uh, other researchers, those who are above you and behind you, that you can build a, a good future in terms of uh, in, in academia or research or whatever uh, field you choose to continue your career in. Now, but if we look at the words critical, the words uh, ethics and collaboration, we notice that they are at the core of every successful endeavor. And in my opinion, I think uh, collaboration is the key to maintain any sustainable success in whatever field you choose to do. Mm -hmm. But now I am a little bit worried when we look at uh, when we look at uh, the way the world is structured nowadays, where we have uh, those who are less privileged yeah. or whose uni who are from universities that are not really among the top tier universities, and these people are completely wiped off the opportunity mm -hmm. map. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. they don't have the opportunity to collaborate with those who are among the elites and uh, they don't even know when it comes, when they don't even have the opportunity to learn from the best when concerning uh, ethics and mm -hmm. uh, building their ethical portfolio will be something, I don't know how I will put it in quote, up to the Western state standard, I'll put it that way, because whatever we want to do, whatever we are trying to do, we are trying to meet a certain standard that has been set by the West, and which we, we believe is like the top notch. Now, but we realize that in the world, in our world today, there is put by us, and uh, which has limited the opportunities available for those people who have not had the opportunity to, to, to collaborate with people from a top-notch universities. And we realize that most students who are having scholarships today or having the opportunity to gain admission into these top universities are those who have in one point in, at one point in time come into contact with some professors from these top universities. And these professors grant them that recommendation and give them the opportunity to participate in groundbreaking collaboration and research work. Now, isn't this the very first step towards killing the set philosophy in PhD? Mm -hmm. Because if, if, if we try, to, if we try to, to, to box those who don't have the opportunity to, to, to meet up, the, they define the set standards, how mm -hmm. do we expect them? How do we expect them to meet up the ethical requirements? Mm -hmm. And then I also want to know how does uh, uh, your program try to address the issue of inequality and bias that I don't know because it's becoming like something natural, which isn't supposed to be the case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackson, for all those very valuable points. So first of all, of course, couldn't agree more, right? So of course, first collaboration is the key and you are completely right here. Um, I think we talked about this also with uh, Daniel and David when we um, spoke last week. So first of all, um, collaboration is something that man, humankind needs to work, needs to learn more, right? So um, we talked about, you know, and especially of course, uh, EcoAmet Solutions is one of the companies who kind of stands for that, right? 
uh, recognizing what are the big problems that the world is facing, right? The pandemic as well as climate change, all the big problems that are there right now show us that collaboration is what will, if at all, allow us to find solutions, right? There's no, not a single big problem there in, in the world yet anymore, right? Which we can solve with just one university, one research group. And this maybe um, might be a sag into what, what you said earlier on. Um, how should more collaborations among basically everybody be encouraged, right? So that not only those who always collaborate means that in this case, the privileged ones uh, collaborate among themselves and other people are excluded from that, right? Yeah. I think in my view, this is my personal view. If you teach the basics of science, the critical thinking skills of science, you create the basics for making science more accessible, not only in terms of cognitive skills, but also more accessible because this is for everybody. Of course, changing the system from the ground up takes time. I'm not saying this is like tomorrow, but what I'm saying and what I think is my personal conviction is that um, this type of teaching science um, will make it possible for many people to connect to scientific thinking. I would say, you know, since I'm a humanist, I might be a bit idealistic here, but um, in my view, this is really for everybody, you know, just that we educators need to become better at making it palatable for everybody, right? So that's, that's an educational skill set that we need to learn, right? So this is uh, something that we, we educators need to learn. But if you, in my view, um, it's not only about you know, having um, setting a standard that is being artificially, in my view, set by some Western universities or for some flagships. I think that's not what we should do. I think because critical thinking is for everybody, the potential to do science right and to do great discoveries is in everybody. I'm giving you one example here, actually two. Um, the, we have a lot of partners in South America a lot of these um, institutions, sometimes individual research groups, sometimes institutions have very little means. So as you know, this is not exactly um, the part of the world which has high income. Um, these people have integrated philosophical foundations into their education forever. It's something that, you know, it's, it's part of their tradition, but also it's something that you can do with very little means. So you don't need high tech equipment or whatever kind of other things that you might only be able to buy with, with all kinds of grants or other kind of collaborations, because it's, it's something that everybody can do. So once you have this critical thinking within yourself, you're being equipped with everything. Then the other thing is about collaboration access. Of course, it doesn't buy you immediately access to all kinds of different collaborations, sure. I mean, equity doesn't come with critical thinking alone, right? However, it is the prerequisite for everything, right? So critical thinking and ethics is something that we need to promote. So what I'm asking of all of you is to be the ambassadors for this type of thinking because, right? Of course, the world is not perfect by far, right? And of course, as we all know, the pandemic is not going to make this any better in the contrary, right? But what I also think is that the pandemic has shown us even more blatantly how the injustices of the world make things even more problematic. This is the time for us critical thinkers. And this is everybody here on this podcast. This is everybody who ticks that way. For everybody who thinks that critical thinking should be for everybody, right? Should be accessible to everybody. That we need to be the ambassadors of this type of thinking to order to make a difference. Just think about, okay, so how many people are on this podcast? 90 people, right? So with on and offs, about 100 altogether, right? So if every one of you, tries to, you know, you don't have to become a full-time educator, but at least be an ambassador for this type of thinking and carry it to the ones who come after you, right? So all of you are being in all kinds of science and science education, scientific practice. Carry this thought to the ones who come after you. You are going to be catalytic, right? I'm a biochemist, right? So we talked about thermodynamics earlier on in our discussion. Carry this to the ones who come after you and you will carry the thought to, to more people. These more people will make more difference and those people who make difference for the ones after them. I'm not saying this is happening tomorrow, but you know, all of us 
can make a big difference in this world. You might have to have the patience that probably your children might benefit from that. Okay, fine. But you know, also our parents invested in us that we make a more, more of a difference for a world that was better than the one that our parents had, right? So it's our responsibility, speaking of responsibility, to carry this thought forward. You talked about inequities. So we teach this, for example, in our university a lot. You might, you might know a little bit about the, um, the city that we live in. So the Johns Hopkins University is in Baltimore. Baltimore leads the pack in terms of homicides and has enormous structural racism and inequalities everywhere. So the, as I think everybody around the world knows the US has enormous problem when it, when it comes to inequities, when it comes to racism, when it comes to all kinds of things that should be better in terms of society. Okay, we know that. And this is terrible. Means we need to do something about it. It's about us educators and us critical thinking scientists to do something about it. What we try to do, for example, um, we try to build things around equity, inequities, health disparities, logical thinking, um, ethical thinking into everything that we do, not only in our courses, but in our practice. We carry this into the community. Um, you asked me about establishing worldwide networks and collaborations. We teach networking and we live networking. Um, my program is not endemic to our institution or to the US alone. Uh, my program is actually uh, something that is the so-called RISE network, which is a global network. Um, we, since we are young, of course, we are only <laughs> a couple of years old. We are not um, as much further along in, in the way that we wanted for that. However, what we are building, for example, and this comes to your question about access to collaboration and access to um, other groups around the world, we are building an open access uh, of um, database for educational resources for educators around the world, right? Of course, this is my influence here is educators, right? But of course, there are also educators who do a lot of practice, right? For example, education like Daniel and David, right? So for example, you both are doing educational practice in as educators, as well as in your scientific practice, right? As well as some field implementation when it comes to uh, David's company, right? So all of, it doesn't matter in which way you bring the critical, ethical, logical, communication skill thinking into your practice, but you're going to make a difference. And what we do, of course, in the, in the sphere that I have in my influence is that I'm building up, for example, databases and building up networks and ways for people to meet. Like this webinar is golden, it's just wonderful. I'd like to, by the way, I'd like to invite everybody of you to participate in our symposium. That doesn't cost anything, right? So I'm going to maybe um, bring the advertisement for the symposium uh, when we have it um, to Daniel and David and you can distribute it among yourselves. So where we actually try to educate other educators how to bring this type of critical thinking into their practice. Yes, it is a long-term approach. Yes, it will take at least one, if not two more generation to really have something that's broad scale, but I'm convinced that we can make a difference. It's just that we all need to work together to do that. I cannot do it alone and none of you can do it alone, but as a network, we can. The big advantage of us having to recalibrate due to the pandemic is that we all got more used to connecting through so Zoom, through what have you, through WebEx, to all kinds of other technologies that are there, right? Skype. It's making it much more normal to connect around the world, right? It's making it also much more normal to reach out to people. Networking is something that doesn't come to you. Networking is something that you need to do. See, Dave, David and Daniel reached out to me out of the blue, right? So this was an email that came. Fine. Okay, that's okay. Totally fine. Just do it. Right? So what can happen if you want to establish a collaboration and are, you know, taking your life into your hand and do it, right? Try to reach somebody. Okay, what can, and the worst thing happen? The person says no or does nothing. Okay, fine. Good. Ask the next person. You know, it's fine. They're, they're, you know, when, when we started, David and Daniel asked me earlier, you know, how did you start this program? Um, yes, there was resistance. But what we also noticed, and there was ignorance, there still is. But what we also noticed in our program is a change potential of two to 5% is enough. 
So you have a couple of people who want to make a difference. Sure, the circumstances are not encouraging. The disparities and the inequities are terrible. You know, they're just terrible. And I do realize that I am one of those who were lucky to be born in a very rich country and transferred to another rich country. But, you know, I think I mentioned very early on in my, uh, in my conversation, I'm not coming from an academic background, right? So like, it was, it was something that was foreign to me too, right? So I'm not saying that I'm, you know, it's short. Sure, Germany is rich and you don't fall through the grits very easily. However, it is something that, you know, by, by walking your life step by step, you can make a difference in your life and with other people's lives. And, you know, just as a personal kind of note, being an educator is very fulfilling. So if you're looking for, if you're looking for something in your life that really gives you a calling, and if you feel you want to, you know, make a difference in other people's lives, if you want to join our ranks and, you know, make a difference around the world, this is, there's nothing more fulfilling than to be an educator. You know, you don't have to be like a full-time teacher. You can do this in many ways. You can mentor, you can influence other people. And again, these are 90 to 100 people on this podcast, right? And then we influence other people and these people do the same to others. This is catalysis. We can make a difference. Again, you know, the, the structural inequities of the world are not going to be solved anytime soon. However, you know, if we don't make a start, they were never going to be. And the critical thinkers are the ones who will make the difference. We will and we can, right? Again, join our network, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful community. Um, I send you the invite. It's, it's something that's of course focused on education, but it doesn't mean that the RISE network doesn't have room for people who wanna be on the implementation side. So for example, if you wanna form a network that says, okay, how can we use critical thinking, ethical thinking, education, influencing others in education to work against inequities. For example, let's take an example of how to access good education, how to um, gain the necessary networking and communication skills to establish good collaborations in terms of doing team science in order to tackle, let's stay with our um, motto of, um, of Ecoamit solutions, let's stay with um, environmental solutions. Let's tackle certain aspects of climate change. Let's tackle certain aspects of um, pollution in my neighborhood. You know, it can be in your neighborhood, can be something that's bigger. You know, it doesn't matter where you, where you make a difference. Every difference will count as long as you, you know, grassroots wise, pull other people in. I know this is humongous and I'm asking a lot of you. But see, you guys are young. This is the life is in front of you, right? So this is the time to get into critical thinking education and get not only this type of thinking for yourself, but also give it to others. This is our time as educators to bring this to the world. You will make a difference. You're just, you know, how old are you? Like in your early twenties? Oh my guys, so many years to come. Probably, you know, in your case, quite a few of you are going to take, going to get a hundred years old, right? So like, this is the, this is the generation which can get much older. So you have 80 years in front of you. I think there's quite a bit of a chance to make a difference. Wow, this is this is just amazing. Thank you so much. Um, you've actually answered some of the questions that we're actually now coming through. Um, we have about 10 minutes to end this conversation and I would like us to um, take this question here from um, one participant. He says, thank you so much for the insightful submission, please. Can you mention some of the logical errors that led lead to the retraction of an already published paper? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, could these um, include unintentional errors? Uh -huh. So yeah, please um, take this one for us. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for, for um, <laughs> mentioning this very applied example, right? Um, so that's actually my, one of my favorite exercises in, in some of the classes, mainly because it's so practice applicable. So when it comes to research or to, you know, applications in science. Um, so what I would, um, I would have almost said encourage you to do. <laughs> um, if, you, if you look into retractionwatch.com, of course, it's rather discouraging than encouraging because it shows <laughs> how many articles had to be retracted, right? 
First of all, yes, there are um, multiple categories of errors, right? Some are what we call innocent errors, right? This is just, um, it's actually the vast majority of errors, are, of course, innocent errors, because, you know, it happens, right? It just happens. I mean, most of the errors are in a way that either we were tired, this is a famous random error, or we um, made, uh, made mistakes when it comes to looking at the data one-sidedly, right? So we kind of, Everyone is biased, right? Every human being is biased. There is not a single person who is not biased. This is just the way how we tick. The main is because, you know, minds are deceptive, right? This is the way how we are structured. It's like this. As long as, as, long as we are not critically evaluating ourselves enough or asking a colleague to evaluate what we are doing, right? Using basic peer review, I always mention coffee, right? Or kind of get, get somebody to sit with you over tea or coffee and say like, can you quickly check what I've done here? Like, is this okay? Um, this happens more often than you think that you, you know, who hasn't done that, right? So for example, you wanna, you wanna reach something in your, in your research project, right? You get a set of data and then you absolutely want to have a certain outcome, right? Because you are so sold to the idea, you're passionate about what you're doing. And then you fool yourself, right? So you fool yourself because you look at the data with that mindset in mind that I want to prove my hypothesis wrong, right? like wrong or right, right? So, and then unfortunately it happens so often that you think like, you know, okay, the data look a little bit like this, you know, so, and here's an outlier. Um, yeah, I think that outlier is surely just an outlier. Just let's cancel that outlier, right? So this, this is about the famous fooling ourselves, right? So you kind of are so convinced that the mainstream data is going, for example, this way and make a fit. And then like, oh yeah, these are the data. So I kind of think I can ignore them because they're surely just outliers, right? This is what we do all the time, you know? So like fooling ourselves with cognitive biases. Other things are, um, um, I wouldn't say mechanical, uh, in a certain way that, um, uh, our abilities to do statistics right, right? Statistics, of course, is a great tool, but unfortunately, <laughs> statistics also offers us a great way of shaping the data in a way that we want to see them, right? Um, how often have you seen that, you know, either a colleague or have you found yourself tempted at, at the very least, right, to do the so-called p-hacking or this kind of data massaging, right, in a certain way? You, you figure out a way to, um, um, choose the significance cutoff in a way that it's exactly right where you want to have it, right? Or, you know, the, the famous uh, 0 0.05 significance cutoff, right? So the data, let's, let's assume you get seven data points that have a p-value of 0 0.495, right? So like just right according to, right? So what do you do with data which are just above or just on top of this uh, or been below that, that significance kind of, what does it say to us, right? So like how often do you see people making mistakes there, particularly in the biomedical and in the medical uh, areas, you find multiple articles which are just absolute crap in this area, right? So you make a significant statement about something that's just right at the edge, right? So just because you wanna see it, right? You have, um, all kinds of misunderstandings. So for example, we have logical fallacies when it comes to um, um, making statements that are going, uh, giving the reader the impression that there's only two possibilities, right? Either 100% right or 100% wrong, but there's actually a lot of gray zones in between, right? How often, you know, is this the case in science that we have 100% one thing and 100% the other way? Most of the time we have gray zones in between, right? What we what we don't do often in, in science, we teach not so much to the gray zones, right? Those things which are, and their the ethics comes into play, right? Where we need to weigh, right? So what are what are um, arguments pro and con? And also how, how much do we weigh those arguments pro and con? Most people don't like them very much because our brains, again, our brains prefer clear cut solutions, right? This is how we humans are structured, right? However, you know, how many times in life is this the case? Most of the times in life, you don't have 100 or zero things. You have the stuff in between 100 and zero, right? And this determines our lives. We need to make decisions. And these decisions are then, you know, unfortunately influenced by biases. What helps always here is, and this comes to, you know, avoiding those mistakes that are, you know, our must in the retraction watch database, is that we need to um, ask, our colleagues, our peers, our friends, 
to critically evaluate us, right? We need to cope with the, speaking of critical thinking, right? We need to start with us first, right? Am I, am I objective here? Am I doing a good job in evaluating all the different opportunities and possibilities that are here, right? And if I think that I'm too tired for that, then ask somebody else to do it, right? And so these things quite often led to um, mistakes. And I think the original question was also about um, um, how, how, do you, how do you see them in the, um, uh, in the literature? Uh, the only thing you need to do is to go to retractionwatch.com and this is a search engine. It has a search, search box and look for certain mistakes, right? So for example, logical or look for um, image duplication, look for certain types of research misconduct that is you know, always taught in the responsible conduct of research kind of uh, research ethics um, uh, courses. Or look at look at papers. There's multiple papers um, which are um, have been published to look at the errors of science, right? So, for example, one thing is you can um, look at Casa de Val and Fang. So Casa de Val, like you know the Spanish word Casa de Val, there's a double L at the end, and Fang F A N G. Uh, if you look at if you Google those two and errors in science, you come to a paper in FASEB F A S E B. And this is uh, categorizing all kinds of types of errors in science. Right? It's one of the flagship papers in this in this field. I can I can share resources later if you want. Right? We don't have to write this down right now, but we can we can share with the community. Um, another thing you can do is you can again um, join us for our um, symposium of the R3 and Rise Network. Again, it doesn't cost anything. It's by Zoom. You know, you just zoom in. <laughs> if you do, if you if you're not awake by that time, um, we will start with with Asian compatible time zones and also African compatible time zones. But in case you are um, not available at the time, we are going to record a lot of that, so you can also watch recordings after that. And it's not doesn't cost anything either. So, but uh, you know what this community does is, and I'd be happy to have you all in this community because you are the educators of the future, right? So, um, we we discuss among ourselves how do we best bring this to our students. How do we best try to choose like the same questions that you just have? How do we make it more accessible? How do we foster collaborations around the world, by the way, not only in the US among the privileged places, but you know, I, for example, have partners everywhere. So my network extends to South America, to places in Africa, to places in Asia. So, you know, and it doesn't need, it doesn't need to be just my network, form your networks also. Join our, join our groups and, uh, look into who's in there, who might be a person who you want to collaborate with. Uh, by the way, one tip in terms of how to um, establish collaboration, apart from, you know, like David and Daniel reaching out and say like, you know, you want to talk about certain aspects. Try to think about what we can write together. You know, publish something. Not all publications cost something. There's way to publish without cost, by the way, right? So you can work with media, with social media, with, with, with websites, with all kinds of things, right? Um, these things are good ways to form collaborations, to build them sustainably and to keep them, right? To bring other people in there. You can form your networks. It's just, you know, the, the thing is, this is a proactive process. It's not something that comes to you, you have to do it. Sure, there will be people who don't react to your questions. So ditch them, take some others, right? You know, how many people are there in science? Tons. You know, it doesn't matter. Just don't, don't focus on those people who, who do not react the same way as, as you wanted. Talk to those people who react, right? And who are active. Only those count. And with them make a difference. It will be enough. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, there are some few questions here, but we really have to respect time. And so, um, I'm definitely going to email you these questions. And mm -hmm. if you so, have time, you can respond to these ones. So I apologize to anyone if we cannot forward the questions right now. So before we close, I will just like to take the last poll and uh, just, let, just let us know your thoughts if you would like to join us again. Okay, thank you. You guys are so kind. <laughs> so thank you guys so much for joining today's webinar. And uh, we will definitely keep your emails. And uh, if there is anything, you have any question, please contact us at info at echoamidsolutions.com 
or glcpodcast at ecowomensolutions.com. And as we've already mentioned, um, we are actually having a section on our podcast called The Research Stories, where we interview people and discuss their research. For now, it's people within the um, environmental um, uh, discipline, but we hope and we really pray that we can extend this into other disciplines as well very soon. So if you're interested, email us in the same emails uh, and we will get in touch with you. So thank you so much for joining today's port, um, I always say podcast. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar and we hope to engage you with you um, soon. I don't know if doctor, you have any last remarks. I, I just wanted to say it was such a pleasure to be with you all. I'm so impressed and I'm so honored to be with you. I just would really like to keep up the conversation to keep up you know, the connection you know, uh, David and Daniel are, you know, the best examples to say that you can network, you can reach a lot, you can reach a lot of people. So how about everybody does the same? And again, I'd be happy to answer the questions, but if you um, have any need for more Q&A, you know, we can arrange something like this, right? It's not a problem. Of course, nowadays, you know, with global technologies for communication, we can totally yes. do that. So I'd be happy to be available at a different time for, um, for any kind of other Q&As. And I definitely hope to be staying in touch with uh, Daniel and David and to deepen our collaboration. Perfect. So thank you so much. And uh, thank um, you very much. see you guys yeah. soon. We hope to interact with you guys soon. So have a good night, okay. have a good day okay. and see you soon. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye.